It's live time. Hello everyone. This is the first CM Kozeman live YouTube stream. It's a very cringeworthy and amateur effort. We are live from secret control base bunker, Istanbul. Let me set this up a little. Well, you're just going to have to contend with my balding face for the next hour or so. Hello, jackpots. Opinion on Morbius. David Gurola says Vulcan V. This is derived from a Hebrew letter, by the way. It's a nice piece of trivia. Okay. All right. We're live here at the control center. Looking like a Kerbal space program or some shit. All right, nice, nice questions are already pouring in. Okay, so for, for one hour, I'll just randomly answer all the questions. Wow, we got a spicy question already. Opinion on Ataturk. He was a great guy. Some would say otherwise, but then they have no interest in living in Turkey, I guess. Anyways, somebody asks, do you think artists can ever fill the social cultural niche occupied by shamans? The waning of shamanism has led to a toxic ossification of epistemic categories. Yes. In fact, I think the toxic ossification of epistemic categories was brought about by the so-called advance of modernity. And metrics really help us advance certain parts of life, but they also dry up other aspects of life. Now, artists, I don't know if they can fill the space left by shamans. I think actually people who occupy that niche are Stuff like faith healers, clergy people, religious people, like religious ministers, and imams or priests and rabbis and so on. And also in communities, you got like lots of faith healers or like old ladies who kind of you know work this kind of public magic kind of stuff. I think those fill the roles of shamans more than artists. I mean, you could have a special kind of artist who's like completely destitute, broke fed by scraps by the community and then he or she can be the village shaman but today's conception of an artist is uh, too different from a shaman fancy simp you're literally my idol all hail the arachnid king yes i can do my arachnid king improvisation this is the stream for the next three hours. Okay. Doomy asks, opinion on Morbius. I haven't watched it. There's some memes about it. Grand Reddit Hotel. What a nice hotel is there? Reddit Hotel. How many rooms are there in that facility? Is the swimming pool disinfected? Hey, man, have you ever seen Raised by Wolves? I've seen parts of it. It's by either directed or managed or produced by James Cameron, or no, sorry, the other guy, Ridley Scott. Good concepts there, actually, like the whole deal with them, mother robot making the colonists, it's, there was something similar in All Tomorrows. Doomy says heresy, lol. Hello, author from billions of years in the future. Well, I'm actually in the year of our Lord 2022, just a regular guy talking from underground bunker, in his temple. What else? What else? We got lots of nice questions. Okay, somebody asks, are you familiar with Ibn Haldun's cycle of Asabiyah? Uh, do you think his theories are relevant to modern discussions of societal collapse? Okay, this is a good question. Ibn Haldun was a based uh, Muslim scientist who lived in the golden age of uh, the uh, Muslim caliphate. Basically, his gist goes like, you know, the famous thing these days is going about hard men make good times, good men make hard times. No, good men makes, no, wait. Ibn Haldun basically says, first generation fights, second generation builds, the third generation writes poetry or grows exotic tulips, and then everything crashes, comes tumbling, tumbling, tumbling down again. Basically, now a similar variation of this theme is very popular these days, especially among right-wing groups. And they say, 
hard men make good times, good times breed soft men, soft men make bad times, bad times breed hard men, all these men getting hard and soft all over again. On the surface, this is true. In some societies, you can really see this happening. I mean, I think if you study Ottoman history, you can really see this happening. They, they rule most of the known world and then they stagnated. But their stagnation had to do less with the Ottomans collapse or like they didn't suddenly turn into soft men or decay. It's just the other guys discovered America and there they had a whole um, access to a whole new world of riches. And against that, the Ottomans couldn't just compete. So on the surface, this Asabiya, Ibn Haldun theory, on the surface, it's true. I think it's more true for families and dynasties rather than for states. I mean, you got many cases in everyday life where the first generation is like a hard studying engineer. He pulled himself up from his bootstraps, built a big company, made a lot of money. The second generation, they're basically boomers. They enjoy fine wine. And they hate people who go to Walmart or they, they think people who, who are too scruffy. You know, they're so unstylish. And then their kids, they're just doomed. So, yeah. Another question. Okay, wow. Well, I got many questions coming. I, I never thought this would be so popular. Fernando Kekatik says, micro bullies. And this is so good. Micro bullies, everyone. Type it up. Let's see what kind of clout I got with my chat over here. Micro bullies. But you know what's better than micro bullies? What if we toad bullies? So there's apparently a toad variety of these micro bullies where they're like, even more diseased they're all I'm, I'm kidding you not they're all the offspring of this one micro bully named mr toad he's who's at all limbs splayed so these toad micro bullies are even smaller they got even freaker heads and all of their legs are splaying about god i would buy one in a heartbeat if it wasn't for my wife but she thinks they're superfluous and maybe she's right grand reddit hotel says i'm more of a macro bully yes and they're also meso bullies the whole spectrum of bully fauna. Victory Game says, hello, Don Casaman. Love from California. Hello to sunny California. It must be very early up there, so thanks. Barack Obama, too, says, CM Casaman, I'm sorry for invading Turkey in Heart of Iron 4. Well, oh, it's just a game. It's my one of my favorite, favorite parts of any narrative. It's this future dystopian kind of science fiction story in which they have got colonies on the moon and there's a nuclear war and then the moon colonists they're actually the bad guys they built this incredible habitat with these low gravity animals and plants and then when the nuclear war happens between moon and the solar system the, the whole lunar habitat they built is yeah, annihilated in a nuclear strike the, our heroine is in the lower levels she's hiding but basically what happens is that she's hiding and there's like you know, it's a nuclear and then technic technician guy says that's the dome gone man all our work and then she's super cool she says it's just an artifact so you invaded turkey in hearts of iron it's just a game okay <laughs> Jackpot says, earlier this year, scientists uploaded an entire silicon worm's body into a computer, cells and all. If it then proceeded to act the same as a regular silicon worm would, do you think that this is life? I don't think it's life as we know it, but it's a representation of life that's so advanced that ethically it's the same thing to kill that as it is to kill a, a living organism. I mean, imagine writing these wild Imagine killing Sims characters. You know, that's really cruel. Why would you do that? You wouldn't shut off the silicon war either. So it all comes down to your heart of hearts, I guess. Do you want to inflict pain on an organized being? If it's organized in the cyberspace, it's just a different form of life. I mean, it's a different form of ethics. How responsible are you for life? How, how empathic are you? Do me says, oh, Mihuhito says, reptiles or amphibians. Well, reptiles, it would have to be. I love lizards. 
So amphibians are really, really sophisticated too. And I think there are more species, or I don't know. The amphibians are really crazy. They metamorphose. I mean, they start with like little tatar, they would say. And then they grow into quite advanced macro scaled tetrapods. Okay, so since this is the so social collapse stream, let's answer some social collapse related questions. But I have to warn you, it was just a marketing gimmick so that more of you would come to watch. Okay. Bop, 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 bop. So, Kozman, is it possible that a society trying to control itself too much could lead to its collapse? It's possible. Depends on the means of control. I mean, looks like our society may actually avoid no. social collapse by implementing rigid forms of control mediated by digital technology, a police army state indistinguishable from an occupying force. And it's really, really difficult for such a strength, strong structure to be brought down by any force within or without. All right, let's look at it. Grand Reddit Hotel asks, what's your opinion on cryptocurrency and other speculative investments in brackets? When I see people making millions of dollars of the new trend investments, I can't think help but think of the tulip bubble. You're on right, right track, I think. Now, okay, this is not investment advice, but even today, I just had this debate with my conversation with my wife earlier this week even today we value the worth of bitcoin with dollars is ah oh, bitcoin rose it's x dollars oh bitcoin fell it's y dollars still measure it in dollars your mind still keyed on dollars and cryptocurrencies if i could pay this internet cafe experience with it maybe maybe i don't know as a technology it has some merit but I think it was one big, uh, how do you say, wild goose chase. And uh, I mean, this is not advice, but personally, whenever I had meager savings, I invested them in gold and currencies of various stable countries. Swiss francs are a good bet. Cheeky Monk asks a very important question for social collapse. How many cats are necessary to survive a recession? Okay, so for this, you need to have a serious setup. You need to have one chunky cat who's extremely fat and round. And this is the cat you beat on and you call the police on that. Then you need a very small cat who's like from the corner and he goes like this and chews on your cables. And then number three, you got a, you need a stone cat who always looks like this with this kind of saliva coming out so if you get if you acquire these t three cats not even even how dooms collapse can touch you matilda duff says i give it 10 i don't know what you give it to but give it all sister morda and dargon says memoson have you watched the melancholy i don't know what that is i mean just gonna have to google it Oh, it's an anime, a light novel. No, I haven't watched it, sorry. I was a big anime viewer during the worst of COVID. It's kind of abated somehow, but I watched some really good, really good shows. People, these some, some people have this like bad rap on anime. They think it's degenerate. I don't know. All the good anime I watched, they're all about the best values, friendship, standing up for your friends, standing up for society, being a good, responsible person. If you watch degenerate anime, it's your fault. I think anime is actually more based and more solidly grounded in ethics than many Western kids shows. Western kids shows are mostly about this one character, one character. And there's like another character, another character. It's about all you, all you, all me. That you get to do it all. You rule the world. You kill the bad guys. And that's a totally, totally wrong way to inculcate morality in any person, child or adult. Will says, I just joined. Welcome, Will. Good investment tip, says VT99. Give your money to CM Cosma. Yes. Go to Patreon. You know, none of these streams are monetized. My channel isn't monetized. I'm only burning my house. 
says Joker in The Dark Knight. For very complicated ethical reasons, I don't make a single penny from YouTube, and I never plan to. I think these are uh, Asian letters. Sorry, didn't mean to make fun, but he, he or she asks, how many rats does it take to overrun the Supreme Court of the United States? Please answer quick. I'm at the NYC subway right now collecting them. I don't know. You need rats and you need the three cats. Go get the cats. Eber values a how long time follower. Thank you, man, for being here. Really appreciated. Do you sometimes feel that the sense of comfort out of the idea that social collapse, collapse might reset most of our current social ills? Yes. I feel the F word out of this. In fact, one of my biggest fantasies is, of course, it's like, okay, there's a good quote. It says, deep down inside, every person wants, secretly desires their own destruction. This is very true. So one of my biggest fantasies is that one day we wake up, overnight there's been a solar flare. No, no computers work. No, none of the stuff works. You boil some water, you get some eggs, go to the supermarket, eat some bananas. Credit card doesn't work. It's going to be absolute chaos. And of course, wouldn't want to be caught in this in a surgery ward or on an airplane, I guess. But there's nobody I know who does not secretly harbor this. You know, I wish this computerized crazy experience would stop the tempo, relentless tempo of work. I mean, digital technology is really good. It's, it allows me to speak to you. It allows you to speak to me. Also allows you to, allows others to bully other people over Zoom meetings. And so, of course, there's that sense. In fact, one of my favorite films is a Turkish film called Piano Piano by Jaxus. That's P-I-Y-A-N-O. P-I-Y-N, Piano Piano by Jaxus. B-A-C-A-K-S-I-Z. Okay? This is about a real life or a sort of real life story about the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. So it's World War II. The Ottoman Empire has just collapsed. Well, it's co it collapsed actually 20 or 30 years ago. World War I came and went. Turkey lost millions of people. Horrible experience. New generation was raised. Now it's World War II. There is famine everywhere. Everybody's impoverished. So this movie is about a group of people there's like an old couple a single woman whose husband died in the war a young archaeologist who's trying to make it big by striking up a byzantine gold dig or something and then there's this main character kid and there's his family all these people inhabit various rooms in a decaying ottoman mansion that once used to house only one family of Ottoman nobles and their servants. Of course, they fled or died, but now all these people live in these rooms of this house. But the house is so big, it's falling apart. And it's like a village. Each room is a house kind of thing. So these people are, you know, living the bittersweet, bittersweet life. But this movie, regardless of how you watch it, it gives you a, like a really nice sense of coziness inside. So I think if, so like to set one thing clear, I don't think social collapse is going to be like a demolition man or something. It's just going to be gradual lowering of life standards. Like right now we can't afford to travel outside of the country. Uh, the generation of our kids will even less be able to do so. Remember how they were all talking about 5G? 5G networks setting up. We need the budget to set up 5G. What, what now? UK, you need heating more than you need 5g all these futuristic plans sort of slowly are being put into the back burner this is the kind of social collapse one decrement per generation and suddenly three generations later everybody's shelling out to share one apartment somewhere and everybody's hustling trying to make ends meet as long as there's a there's food on the oven life is good as Atatürk used to say, Toroslardaki en son ocak sene ne kadar Türkiye bahsiyar olacak. Okay, let's take more questions.
Barack Obama pro toad says, man, the whole world could collapse at any time. I guess so. There's a good question by Grand Reddit Hotel. Do you think cyberbullying gets enough attention? I see it rampant across social media. And okay, that's a very, very good thing. So in an, in an earlier life, I so we, we, both, we all grew up the concept of the internet as a kind of game arena, you know, in front of the computer, you shoot people, you kill people, you get killed. Because of that, and because the people you interact with cannot reach out to you. And if there's a person here, you couldn't say it, you know, F you, whatever. If there's like a invisible barrier between you. Or if you're just talking to straw people and you're somehow convinced you're talking to people who are making the world worse, you're under that delusion, then you can be pretty argumentative. You can be pretty sharp. But long time ago, in another life, you know, I, I saw the different end of the cyberbullying and harassment spectrum. It's really disgusting, hateful, and scary, and dangerous too, to be honest. So I have one mantra. I always, I have some very sharp ideas, if you've noticed, and sometimes I let it show too much, but I have some very set political convictions as well. But whenever I'm online, I go with this mantra. I say, I have no axe to grind, but only my toads to burnish. And this is good. This is how you should always act. Another rule for avoiding cyberbullying is your friends are only your friends if you meet them in real life. Like you could meet someone online and then take this friendship into a real life friendship. Then, okay, you're good friends. But otherwise, you know, in places like Discord, wherever you're, you new generation people are hanging out these days, don't talk anything you wouldn't scream out on, on the streets, you know. Keep private and don't let people, they're just text on the screen. It's just an artifact. Nico K asks a very good question. Yo, 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 CM Koza man. Yo, 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 Nico Filemu. Uh, what lessons can the study of ecology teach us about culture? Can ecological thought help avert social collapse? Good question. Okay, so it's a bit, I don't know. I mean, certainly ecology teaches us one thing, and this is how important food security and water security are. You know, everybody, everybody in the last 10, 25 years thought about making this a digital country, digital friendly country, digital native country, digital country. But you neglected farming, you neglected, but the US didn't. Americans are very, very smart. The British neglected farming, and most of Europeans did too. Well, not, not all Europeans, but most European countries too. The United States has, it's, it's really like God's chosen land on earth. They have got all the food that you know, they need for the next 500 years. Some other countries did, they were even like more foolish about it. They thought if we tech hard enough, if we invest hard enough, all the people will come in buying and selling products and services, earning the money, we can't eat money. So that is one way ecology can <laughs> help you. All of us ask a very personal question. Are you atheist, Mr. Kozeman? If you asked this to me 10 years ago, I would say, yeah, I'd be a fedora wearing internet atheism. Because like 10, 20 years ago, it was a big thing, you know. People were wrongly convinced that the internet would lay out all the fallacies of religion. People would act, suddenly act very re regional. People in the Bible Belt or like mm -hmm. oppressed members of other religions. Oh, my life has been a lie. Let me go to the big city and buy and sell products oh, and God. services. That didn't work out that way. Sure. In fact, I think technology has given religion a new lease of life, but it's going to mutate into a form that even the previous adherents oh, of early religions will find heretical. Personally, I think the world we inhabit is the mind of God. I have some very unrational and unlogical 
personal convictions in my heart of hearts, but you'll never get to know that. Doomy says, imagine how terrifying it would be to kill an enemy soldier, and he just starts saying racial slurs, even if his face is blown off. But that's really scary. Killing and being killed is a whole other experience. But I have no experience with that, obviously. Mihuhito, he's asking, he or she's asking really good questions. What are your thoughts on Carl Jung's shadow? I haven't read about it. Probably has to do with Jungian psychology, but don't know. Sorry. Zappelzak asks, what movie universe would you like to develop extended lore in? Star Wars, obviously. Even, even at the current state, it's been like, you know, defiled, violated. Even in its current state, it's got some really nice tear-jerking moments, Star Wars. And soundtracks, the spaceships. I would love to develop the Admiral Throne trilogy. If you don't know what this is, it's an extended universe. Think of the Star Wars universe, obviously. So there's a whole series of novels about this very elite, cultured, alien, imperial gentleman. He's part of the Empire. He's one of the bad guys. But he's super cool. He's got blue skin, red eyes. And he's super cultured and super artistically savvy. And he's a grand tactician, grand admiral throne. I would love to develop that series. Casting, concepts, characters. Go find those novels and read them. Admiral throne. Nico K asks, take that back. Mesoplodons are the face of God. True. If you have jawline going like this and these teeth somehow encircle your head, kind of look like God already. And that values how asks, are you a fan of komboloi? I heard they're popular in Turkey. Like Byzantine fidget spinners. I don't know what komboloi are. It must be a Greek word. Let me Google it. Oh, these are the worry beads. Christians have them. Muslims have them. Even I think some Judaic sects have them. Or even some uh, other Abrahamic religions, such as the Druze, also have them. They're, I think, a... Uh, Levantine thing, worry beads. Personally, I have a tick. When I see a disconnected button or a little bead or a little coin or something, I, I start feeling like I'm going to throw up. So I cannot touch jewelry or beads or anything. Not my thing. But uh, it, like a lot of old gentlemen here wave them. Sometimes you get these like sharky traders who got like these worry beads made out of precious gems and they try to sell them for enormous prices like as expensive as some watches. Matilda Duff shares a spider icon. Yeah, of course. There's a war going on in my comments about what is the face of God, spiders or mesoplodonts? How about I say arachnodonts? Imagine mesoplodonts with serikera and eight eyes. That's a face to behold. I don't want to buy a bead. I don't want beads. More questions, more questions. Barack Obama says, where did you get inspired for all yesterdays? This is the dinosaur bro book that I wrote mostly and illustrated together with John Conway, who also wrote some sections and did most of the illustrations. And then Darren Nash came over and wrote our introduction. So we are the three authors, and the inimitable Scott Hartman did the skeletal drawings. I mean, all three of us, me, Darren, and John, we were both looking at dinosaur reconstructions, and we were saying, well, something's off with these. We were passing emails back and forth, doing sketches, and at the end of the day, we just thought about making it into a book, and there it was. Grand Reddit Hotel says, rip John Conway, but no, he didn't die. He's alive. If you're talking about John Comey, the mathematician who wrote the Game of Life, he passed away recently. Great loss for the community. Jose Leon asks, would you like to live for 1,000 years in the future knowing you would see everyone you know pass away? That's very sad. I would still say a hard yes to this. But, you know, at least make my wife immortal too. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, man. 
Hello to all spiders masquerading as humans. Okay, I just this bunker is so sweaty. I just need to do a little face wipe for a second. Watch this advertorial for that. Don't take no advertorial. Here. Marilyn Cater asks, what's your general opinion on the Joe Rogan podcast? No, I think a close friend and I had an argument about this, actually. So I think I think a world in which we have Joe Rogan is a better world than a world in which we don't have Joe Rogan. He's a curious guy, came from a different background, and he's got interesting listeners, interesting speakers, so and he's racking in millions of views, so he's extremely successful, must be doing something right now. Huh? The only problem I had with him was like, during COVID when he was like, I threw the kitchen sink at it, monoclonal antibodies, and it kind of got stuck in my mouth too. He took all the monoclonal antibodies, vitamin C drip, he took the micropolis, and this was irresponsible. Millions of people were watching it. And it was very easy, very easy for him to say, you know, hey, just in case, get vaccinated. And as in Turkish, as we would say in Turkish, vebaline girdi. Yani o kadar insanın ölümünde senin de vebaline geçti bunlar. Oldu mu şimdi? You know, he did wrong there, but overall he's he's a great guy. I, I like him. I I mean, there is no. I mean, remember when you when you're talking about public personalities, personalities, except for people who are like extremely egregious, like that guy who bought the AIDS drug and hiked the price up six thousand times or something. Except for people like that, genuinely bad people are very rare, as rare as genuinely good people. So, so is people. Not only people always have a gray area, people are a gray area. And it's it's always very good. Maybe it makes you less edgy, less cool, or less interesting, but it's always good not to pass off harsh judgments for better or worse. <laughs> are you still selling paintings, perhaps on Patreon? Well, if you go to cmkozaman.com, go to the art section, or most paintings there are for sale. Email me. Do you think that the United States will become an oligarchy or is it one? Oh, oh, oh. in Turkey, say, good morning, brother. It's already an oligarchy. The whole world is an oligarchy of oligarchies. ZCESD35 asks, what's your opinion? on the paleo art for Cambrian animals? Good question. Well, I got a pet peeve about Cambrian animals, actually. Except in very rare cases, we just don't know what they look like. We see a blob, but trying to reconstruct it minuscule in minuscule ways, unless you have like dozens of specimens, it's very hard. And especially for things like Opavinia, for example, you know, the five-eyed creature with long trunk, sleep stuck. I, maybe it didn't have five eyes. Maybe the fifth eye is just a nerve ganglion. People are always so cocksure about their Cambrian animal reconstructions, very sharp lines. But maybe a better way to reconstruct them would be this like big, blown out impressionist painting. So when you actually shrink it, all the details are there, but in a kind of impressionistic way. So like the fossils, some things are not quite clear. So sweaty in the bunker. Oh, it's almost been an hour already. I'm not gonna call it quit at quits at an hour and a half. So we started at okay at 22:45. We're gonna call it quits. Fernando Kakatrix asks Greek Pantheon, Greek Pantheon versus the Norse Patreon Pantheon. Which wins in an all-out battle? 
Greek pantheon is mostly derived from Anatolia. Actually, I'm reading this great book about. It's called the Land of a Thousand Gods. I should remember the author, but I don't. Let me Google it. Okay, it's called The Land of a Thousand Gods, History of Asia Minor in the Ancient World by Christian Marek, this great German historian. Basically, it's the history of Anatolia from the uh, days of Göbekli Tepe, the from back, oh no, something's happening. Ah, okay, wait, wait, sorry. What was I saying? Land of a Thousand Gods, great book by Christian Marek, history of Anatolia from basically the dawn of humanity until the, until Constantine the Great's reforms. So this huge, huge ancient age of the Hittites, the Phrygians, and you see when you read this book that most Greek gods are actually imports from the Levant. And I mean, personally, I'm biased. I would be biased in that case for the Greek pantheon. Norse pantheon, I don't know, because maybe it's because of those Marvel films that, although there's something very arcane and ancient about them too, but the Greek gods indulge in struggles that are closer to those of mortals, and for that reason, they're more sympathetic to my eyes. I certainly don't know enough about Norse gods as much as I would like to know. Mondo and Argon asks a very good question. How would you compare the two zero zeros internet to the 2010s internet? I mean, you, a lot of old timers like myself, the internet was, and surprisingly to this day, still is yeah. a place you can have your shop not to sell anything, but write anything you want, put pictures, tell any story you want. You still have that freedom. Yet, in the last 10 years, 15 years, human experience online has been shoehorned into social media sites. Of course, they're great force multipliers. I mean, if I was just writing my thoughts on an HTML website, no one would read it, but now I can reach many of you here. So that's good, but also, you can write anything. You can make your own web pages. You know, that freedom is still there, and not many people realize it's there. So that's one way I could compare them. Next time I do this podcast, I'm going to bring some special lights to the internet bunker dungeon. You can see every pore. Isn't it beautiful? ZCSD, as 35 says, the Etruscans really are a mysterious bunch, aren't they? They are. They got this one god or goddess, Tukulka, unbelievable creature. Looks like a kind of a crow-like demon covered with snakes and stuff. It's holding this big stick. And there's a really nice 1970s weird horror film. It's called The Etruscan Kills Again. You can find it for free on YouTube. Go watch it. The Etruscan Kills Again. Great film. And the Etruscan tomb paintings, they're unbelievable. They're very sexually explicit. And there's like scenes like two guys are, you know, hanky-panky, and then Tukulka, the demon, comes to kill them. Maybe it's humor, I don't know. Or maybe, I don't know, it's a warning. I don't know. Nico K asks, spider will soon evolve into a whale. Yes. Matthias Garay asks, can you be good on two arts or should you just focus on one? It's a very hard question. Some people have God-given talent and they're just good at everything. I think the arts mainly split into two forms, time-based arts and space-based arts. Time-based arts are things like sports, music, performance, dance, whatever. Sports is a time-based art too. Space-based arts are for like spastics like myself who cannot coordinate with time or other people if our lives depended on it but we can concentrate really hard and create these grand narratives with text or images so i think my personal answer to that question you have to choose one are you a time person or a space person
friend asks, hey, what time is it for you right now? It's 10 o'clock in the evening, 22.08, night time. And shout out to my dear loving wife who accompanied me to Internet Dungeon diligently. She could have just chilled at home, but thanks. Thanks to her for being with me. No, I'm not going to swivel the camera around. Barack Obama pro toad says, we are in the same time zone. Where are you, friend? Are you in Turkey, Greece, Levant states? Where are you? All right, let's scroll up a bit. A good thing about being a little known YouTube channel is that I can actually read my comments. ZCESD35 says, what are your thoughts on the general idea there will be a demographic collapse? Could it contribute to social social collapse? We are having a demographic collapse already. Like we're not having kids personally. Many people are not having kids. And to grow the population or to sustain it, you don't only need one kid. Many people I know have one kid, two parents. Everyone is working. Everyone is going crazy in an apartment building. But that one kid, it's going to grow up. It's going to be a little lonely. I mean, you need to have three or more kids so that the society sustains itself. I mean, not society, but the population sustains themselves. So wherever, and this is not just common to Turkey, it's common in every quote-unquote civilized world, the civilized part of the world, that you can see the population stabilize, and start to drop. One thing those uh, right-wing people online love to say is that our migrants are having much more kids, they're going to overrun us. They have this, like, like the inverse function of a wet dream. It's like, oh, the whole, the whole of Europe is going to be swamped with, swamped with people from the Middle East, escaping the wars we started, but they never say that part of the equation. Do they? But that's not going to happen. Even in, like, worst case, okay? for a xenophobe, worst case. Take the entire population of Afghanistan. There's a sky bridge from Herat or Kabul into, I don't know, where should we put them? Let's put them in the UK. Let's put them in the Midlands. Even if that happens, of course, there's going to be a tumult and everything for a few, few generations. Then when those people start working at Starbucks, taking tech jobs, taking the goddamn train to work. They're not going to have eight kids, ten kids. They're just going to plateau out. Civilization does that to people. Maybe it's a way of saying, I mean, civilized life maybe does something to us that we no longer want to prolong, prolong our generations. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I'm just looking at questions. In your opinion, what would be a superpower that is weak but versatile enough to become overpowered? Overpowered as in like regionally strong, I think. I mean, there are many countries like that. Russia is one. Turkey is one. Poland is one. Like if suddenly the United States evaporated or Germany evaporated, Turkey, Russia, Poland, to a degree, uh, China and also Japan, you know, they could really start running things around the parts of the world. I mean, any country that has... Hmm, basically, countries like Turkey, Russia, Poland, Japan, not first-rate powers. Maybe Japan is slightly as first-rate power, but... Okay, we can't launch people to space. And I know our people can't take an SUV to take the dog out to poo, but heck, it's not so bad. Look around, I can make this broadcast. Must be such a bad place. That's an example of a versatile superpower, regional power. Grand Reed Hotel says, you are a sharp man. Thank you. How can I help you? Barack Obama says, what is it like to be 
but what is it like to live in the capital of the no. EU Federal Republic? No. Uh -huh. I don't live in Brussels, so I don't know. Okay, there's a slight <laughs> altercation going in the background. I'm not the only person working in this bunker, so I just have to wait for a minute for them to quiet down. Okay. Amir. Okay. Amir. Uh -huh. Amir says romanticism uh -huh. is bigger than enlightenment. Right on. I agree. You know what's bigger than them all? Medieval times. Things weren't as dark as people pictured them to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Life on Europa asks Matthias Garay and also, Mano de Kraken echoes his question. Do you think we can actually discover life on Europa? Yeah, I think that's very likely. I mean, it's very likely we could send a robot probe to Europa or Titan, another Cronian moon, another Jovian moon. And it's almost 100%. I have bet money on it. Not too much, but a little. There's things like little worms and maggots chilling out under the ice. There could be crabs. Now, that would be interesting. And it's almost a foregone conclusion at this point. Ooh, so the question, previous question about superpowers, regional superpowers, was about super strength here region. I don't know, I don't know. These are too abstract to deal with. If I had one superpower, okay, someone asked me earlier on if I'd like to live for a thousand years. Now imagine I could bankrupt a few banks that way because I never die. <laughs> Put some money on interest, watch them squeal for mercy after three centuries. But I think after three centuries, there won't be banks. Okay, I have a question from uh, a very insistent fan, YouTube, Joseph WM. Hello, Mr. Kuzman, why can't you do an interview with me You, were, if you were able to do it with Alchie Text? Like, this guy, thank you for voicing your opinions. He's messaged me lots of times. I've expressed it before. I love to answer everybody's questions. That's why I'm doing these podcasts. Now, I'm especially answering your question because you are a genuine good guy. I mean, you really genuinely ask, but it's just a time issue, man. If you have any direct questions now, ask them to me on chat before the, we still got half an hour or something. Ask them and I'll answer. But direct interview, I just don't have the time. I got my day job, my artwork, my book projects. Sorry. Wonder and there goes sand. It's coarse, rough, and irritating. It gets everywhere. HHHH asks, speaking of political superpowers, would the world be a better place if it was dominated by a different power than the US or multipolar? You know what? I think that's a good question. May not have been as great. I mean, I'm very critical of the current world order, but I'm also aware that other powers have tried to dominate their fair shares of the world my country included they didn't do such a great job at it the u.s is actually even if it's very pragmatic the u.s is doing a good job at like at least putting the right masks on whereas in the in during the cold war cold war you had people like dying to escape people uh, countries under soviet rule i don't know the u.s hasn't done such a bad job until maybe 19, second half of the 1970s when they said, wait a minute, we could equalize everything to the bottom line and, and computers got into play, stocks came into play, and they grew proud. And otherwise, I mean, US quote unquote domination was quite a good thing. Like in Turkey, they built universities, dams, whole entire uh, infrastructure of the country. They trained the, 
best uh, engineers, academics. They also planned a coup, but that's another. ZCSD35 said, do you like to cook? Yes, I'm a great cook, especially became a better one during COVID. I can cook krasa, what was the leek? I can cook a leek and carrot dish, like I can cook all sorts of pasta. I like cooking and, and I really enjoy when I make something and significant people around me eat them. AK friend whose name I can't pronounce asks best weevil is the one with the giraffe neck. I also like the other weevil with the squeam bee face and really long beak and it's got the antenna halfway through. Lovely customer. Blah 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 says, Do you like wild, wild mushrooms? Yeah, but only to look at them. Certainly have no interest dying with foam. Erupting from my mouth and move through. Mondo and Dagon says the Hone Maze movie has always reminded me of the time when humanity escaped. So, yeah, it's a great movie. Wings of Hone Maze. They actually designed a, a, a life on another planet, a like human life on another planet or the future or something. But everything is redesigned. Things like clothing, doors, windows, they redesigned every article you would come into contact with like, in life. It's a great anime. Strongly recommend it. Who got the hiccups? Wings of Onemais. How do you spell it? H-O-N-N-E-M-A-I-S-E. -E. Yes. Matthias Garay asks, best book on history? I wouldn't say it's the best book, but try reading Eric Hobbes poems, Age of Extremes, and then work your way back from there. He wrote a series of four books, uh, Age of Capital, Age of Revolution, Age of Something, and Age of Extremes. They basically start from the 1840s until the end of the Second World War. Really, really great stuff. He's got a left-wing band, but he tries to stay objective. Nico K asks, the medieval period is so underrated, true. We just don't know what happened there, but a lot of quote unquote medieval eras where they gave up on the so called advancement that people had during the Roman era was actually people getting sick of the Roman way of doing things or the Roman projection of power. They said, okay, we're going to do things a different way. Like the way they experimented with religion it started out as pretty regressive. I mean, the early Christians, phew, you think those people smashing the Buddhas in Afghanistan, you think their iconoclasts, you should have seen the early Christians, they were wild, savage. But then they evolved it into like, I don't know as much about this as I should, but people like Thomas Aquinas, all those medieval Christian thinkers, they really took it to strange places. They established the university system we have. They also borrow, borrowed a lot from the Islamic from the Islamic civilization, especially the part of it that was active in Spain. And then they pretended like it never happened. <clears throat> Martin did have comments more about medieval learning. Yes, true. Yeah. HHS, a good good question, spicy question. You said you're very critical of the modern world order. What do you hate the most about it? I guess over technology, technologicization. Actually, no. I, what I hate most about it is the over contextualization. I always tell this story. Okay, I was out with a group of artists and nature people in a nature excursion. Bird, there are some bird watchers in the group. I said, oh, look, there's an interesting goat on the rock. 
that it's not a bird, I'm not interested. What's this? Are you some sort of insect? I get insects are in every aspect of life, from education to other. I, I read this comment somewhere. Basically, like someone was complaining that people should not tell children's stories unless they have a pedagogical license or something. And this is just so wrong, it's almost indistinguishable from pure evil. You need a license for that. You think if you raise your kids that way, your kids are going to be like, sorry, but they're going to grow up to hate you. License for this. A way to do everything. Uh, what I dislike the most about the current world civilization is their pitiful, pitiful vain attempt to break down everything into a drop-down list. You see it in every part of life. And there was these, these famous cases a few years ago in Britain. A girl was selling lemonade on a stand, and then taxi inspectors actually find the poor girl and her family doesn't have the right papers. These things, laws, taxes, education, they are like the container which we need. We need someone. We need them to a degree. They are like the container we need to hold a bottle of water, some disinfectant or some cologne. But in the present day, this container is this big. Everybody is forced to carry it on their back. There's 60 different buttons you need to press. And it only gives this <laughs> tiny drop. I hope you got the metaphor for this. So yes, over specialization and over like when you meet someone in a pub, what are you? Are you an accountant? Are you an artist? Are you a person who manufactures these gray panels? Are you a person who's selling in the business of selling this? The reduction of people to their vocations. It's not gonna take us anywhere for fun. And then technologic technologization or techno extreme technology, extreme legal hurdles. They all stem from that kind of thing. Matthias Garay asks, do you play video games cause men? Ray Bradbury said video games for a lot of time. I used to play these sandbox games. Pharaoh was one of them. I love them. SimCity 2000. I also used to play Spore a lot, you design these creatures, but in Spore, I always never advanced below, beyond the creature stage. I always remained a creature, ran around being a creature. I'm glad I wasn't born in this generation, because I, then I would be playing these realistic mill sims nonstop. Games like Squad or Armory Forger. I love watching them, like the nights my wife, my wife was asleep, I sneak out of the bed, Turn on the TV, pop an arm of reforger video, and then drift off into dreamland. What I like them about is what I like so much about them is not the sense of reality, which is also great. All these like I also like that in these games, if you're like, I have a brother five years younger than me, like all big brothers, I like picking on him. So he used to be he used to be really big into these like battlefield or like Medal of Honor kind of guy. <laughs> Boom. He'd be that kind of guy. Ah, oh, you go and win World War II all by yourself. But in these games, games like Armory Forger or Squad, all these bright young people, they're cooperating. They say section one, take right, section two, take left. Okay, fan out, stay close together, they're cooperating. They're learning to like hold themselves. And it's a great, great game. And, and this kind of gameplay, I think it's the makings of a good person. Someone says, Doomy says, as a proud Brit, meeting people in the pubs usually results in a bar fight or you become best friends. Either it's a usually. <laughs> 
I I studied in the UK, but in London. Nice, nice country, nice society. There's a famous joke. He spilled my print mate, and then it's. Nico K asks the fact that I may have accidentally driven a CM Cosman creature to extinction and spore will hold my dreams forever. Well, it's just a game, man. How long have we been? One hour. Just one hour. 15 more minutes and vote the night. Oh, it's really nice, everyone. Really nice chatting with you all. So slowly, let's go into the... Matthias Gray says, Subnautica is an amazing game on an alien water world. Yes, one of my online friends, Alex Rees, was the designer for that. And, you know, I wish for the day. There's a knock at the door. <laughs> Hello, ring, ring. It's me, CM Kozuman. Yes, we want you to design creatures for our game. Oh, won't that be a great day? I would love to do that. Mondo Andargon asks, will traditional architecture return in the future? Okay, much has been made of the architectural decay, especially in places like Turkey or Greece. I said, ah, in the old times, we all had the nice wooden houses, nice stone houses. Then everybody built so badly these days. Well, if you had gone back to the old times and given those people ready fried bricks, uh, ferro concrete, PVC windows, they would make very similar and, in your perspective, very ugly buildings. It's just the convenience of the materials we have at hand. You know, in like at least, let's say before before World War One, or maybe before the 1920s, building was a trade. You actually needed to be really careful, and the buildings materials were really limited. They were locally sourced. So, you know, you had to go to local brick kit to get the bricks, and then there were certain limitations to what you could do. Now, there are these gigantic factories that, for like extremely cheap prices, make the most useful materials. And, you know, the materials that make our buildings ugly, they're very cheap and easy to use and convenient. And, uh, sorry to say, but these ugly modern houses, they're actually more easy to live in than the old beautiful houses. That's just unfortunate. In the old beautiful houses, people used to spend the winter huddled around the stove or even a brazier. There would be maybe limited access to running water or plumbing or sanitation. If you limit the construction materials, yeah. then you can have a modicum of beauty back again. I would rather live in a only city where I could afford a house, though. I don't care. Like, is are, are any of you from the Soviet, former Soviet countries? I always look at those houses. They look so cozy and livable. I just want to live in one, you know, retreat into one, decorate the F out of it, have my bookshelves, little drawing table. But of course, I haven't lived in a former Soviet country. How was life in those houses, really? If you can write to me in the comments. No, I would have learned something. <laughs> this is a great one. What are your opinions that the conspiracy theory that 1800s Victorian buildings were from a previous civilization? <laughs> so we are actually the alien invaders, and those were the buildings left from the gentle race that we genocided. There's actually a science fiction story like that. It's called Detritus Affected by David Prim. Some modern day archaeologists are doing modern day archaeology at a garbage dump. They dig the garbage dump. They find a skeleton. Oh my God, it must be a murder. Next to it, they, start, they put sinkholes because that's an archaeology thing. Like if, you, if you're digging, there's something here. You dig, 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 dig. Maybe you're lucky you see this, okay? How do you know if there's anything around it? So you also sink shafts around the place. So they sink more shafts, another skill, more shafts, another, another. Suddenly it turns out the garbage dump beneath it, there's millions of skeletons of people who are quite slightly different. And it's never explained. They genocided these unknown people. And the conclusion is left hanging. 
So maybe that could really dovetail well with that conspiracy theory. I don't know the Tartaria theory. I should look. You teach me something new every day. B. Tarsi says, I really appreciate your hot takes and opinions. Thanks. Take care. Too. Okay, let's start to wrap it up. I'm at optimum level. Certainly, in the future, I'll have hundreds of thousands of subscribers. And it will be less hard to keep a dialogue with them. It will be less easy to keep a dialogue with them. Just want to clarify one thing before leaving. In my previous proper video, in which I spoke about many things, I answered the question this thing on uh, transhumanism and Ray Kurzweil. I listened to that video now and it seems to have upset one of my friends. My opinion on this matter stands. I just want to, like, let's lay it out on the table for a second, okay? I, I spoke a bit harshly. Take that, you know, I take that. But, and of course, I, I was too harsh on Kurzweil himself. He's a great scientist, great engineer. He helped invent the system which reads text on your license plate when the police are fining you for overspeeding or something like that. But no, he's like genuinely like overachieving, like overall good business person, inventor, and a good guy too, I guess. But then his book about singularity, what was it called? It came out in 1999, straight hot on the heels of the Matrix. And this book talks about, I need to Google its name. One second, please. Hold that thought. I'm just going to... What was it? The spirit of the machine or something? The age of spiritual machines. Okay. Okay, so this book came out in 1999. And philosophically, it's very wrong. I mean, he looks at everything in an accelerating curve. He, he, he could be great in any other aspect. And, you know, maybe it's not up to me, you know, a Turkish Levantine quasi-Judaic hybrid with pesky YouTube channel to this somebody as successful as that. Okay. But in this book, basically, transhumanism in general, this is my opinion, where the wheels hit the road, there are many disconnections. We still don't understand the human mind. We likely never will. So we're never going to develop the true interface between the mind and the machine. And a big critique I have about uh, transhumanism is this thing. There's no way around it, you know. And if you upload your co copy to a machine, okay, maybe there's some sort of something you still end up dying. Entropy still cannot be conquered, how, no matter how long you extend telomeres. So I'll, I'll really respectfully say, you know, I don't think this is going to happen. And if I upset anyone, any friends, while voicing this opinion in the previous video, I wholeheartedly apologize. I mean, uh, a close friend and I had a kind of falling out about that earlier today. So, yeah. Sorry. Okay, before closing, I'll make a special podcast on Kurzweil and his predictions, and I'll try to be civil. The book's name, David Gorola asks, is The Age of Spiritual Machines, which came out in 1999. I mean, in the present day, Yuval Harari is like that too, Sapiens. Eh? A couple of years ago, oh, 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 everybody was reading that too. Okay, so there's this underappreciated fact in life in general. If you're a successful somebody, you reach a level in which just money or business success is not enough. 
you need to achieve a higher kind of goal. Like Bill Gates, he is trying to develop new toilets for the world or new vaccines. Or like Elon Musk, he's trying to be loud and admired. So this transhumanism theory was Ray Kurzweil's attempt to, to move past the limitations and the ennui caused by being a really successful American inventor. He wanted to do something more. He wanted to leave a mark on the world. He did, he came up with a philosophy. And this is also PR, by the way. It's not coincidence that in the same year, Age of Spiritual Machines came out, the Matrix came out. He dovetailed on that. He, he was riding the coattails of this whole discussion about cybernetics and all that. So PR is like, let's say three fourths of everything you hear about science is PR. Never forget that. Okay, let's go. All right, last question. Monde and Ergon. No, sorry, Grand Rated Hotel. Thoughts on brutalist architecture? Really good, actually. They're trying to take a new kind of material, ferro concrete which has never been used in that way before. You, know, you could never use concrete to build 15-story buildings before. And right, they are trying to give it an aesthetic sense. It's just nice. I would love to live in a brutalist house. I love brutalism too, and I love you all. This has been CM Kozeman's first live stream attempt. Write in the chat what you'd like to speak about the next time maybe i'll make this a weekly thing I, I really enjoyed it really thanks to you all for being here all 34 of you <laughs> this is the best size for a podcast i hope we grow only a little the next time stay safe and have a nice day goodbye it's been a great day bye